Good evening and welcome to another edition of Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, broadcasting live from beautiful Cape May County, New Jersey. Uh, and for those of you who keep up with politics from Legislative District 1, where we uh, <laughs> where we flipped the seat uh, this past election, a Senate seat in our assembly. So I'm very, I'm very excited about that. So I feel like I need to lead with that. And I'm proud of that, that way down here in Cape May County, we were able to do that in a blue state such as uh, New Jersey. Um, but I'm broadcasting via SHR Media, streaming live on Facebook. And uh, welcome back, folks. I'm so glad to be back on the air. My guest today is Peter Pitts. He's an author and president of the Center for Medicine and Public Interest. And we're going to talk today about common sense healthcare. I know it's been um, in the news a lot. Uh, especially with uh, 2020 coming up. So I am very excited to have him on the show today. He's very knowledgeable about the topic and um, I'm just happy to be here. There is, for those of you who do not know, that tonight uh, or today, uh, President Trump started the, uh, I think it's called the Black Voices Coalition. Today I was invited to that, but I wasn't able to go. And I, so I wanted to give a shout out to... Uh, to uh, everybody who was able to attend that wonderful event. I hope you guys are having a fantastic time. Um, but, it, and it's a, it's a good time to be a Republican. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> Albeit, you know, not very popular thing to be for some reason. It's a good time. It's a good time right now to be a Brown uh, Republican. And especially in my district on the local level, not that you guys care, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because I want you to know where I've been uh, I also worked on the local race in addition to the assembly race where we had the first African-American assemblyman to, uh, in Legislative District 1. And I also worked on a local uh, campaign where uh, where we turned our entire uh, county, not county, our entire municipal council red for the first time in history. So... That is uh, just an amazing feat. And uh, our candidate, Jim Norris, worked very hard, as well as our legislative candidates. And you probably have seen bits and pieces about Antoine McClellan, who's the first African-American uh, assemblyman in, in this particular district, who's a Republican. Uh, and, and they all just worked very hard. And I wanted to give them a shout out and congratulate them because they killed it. LD1, Mike Testa led by with Mike Testa leading the ticket, our freeholders, which we're probably the rare people who have freeholders, but we have freeholders. You can look up what that is. Uh, and our assemblymen and our local people, we just killed it. And I'm very proud. So I had to give a shout out to all of you guys um, who got elected and, and put your hat in the ring. Did a fantastic job. Now, that said, in the Money Talk News, but I want to give a shout out to people in the Facey chat. Al, Alexander Bland, hi. I know, I know we have to meet soon. President, uh, youngest president in New Jersey history of the NAACP, Alexander Bland is in the facey chat. Kevin Martin, how you doing? John Campbell, how are you? Good to see you. Glad, th thank you for being here. And Money Talk News, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the news. The CEO of The Gap is leaving. I don't know, those of you who shop at The, at the Gap might be concerned about that, but he's stepping down uh, after what's described as a challenging uh, quarter. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm too concerned about that. Gap, the Gap has been making a lot of changes. They also uh, own Banana Republic and um, Old Navy as uh, under their uh, control. Uh, let's see what else. <laughs> uh, the Saudis are investing in cloud kitchens, according to the Wall Street Journal. The former CEO from Uber, Travis Kalanick, uh, has raised $40 million for this new startup from Saudi Arabia. That's interesting. Uh, and it's one of Uber's largest backers, but I, which I didn't know. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. Um, for those of you who did not know, Sears, and who also owns Kmart, are closing more stores. I'm going to be honest, didn't know that Sears was still open. There's like one Kmart um, not too far from where I live that somebody posted the other day that it was closing. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't know it was still open, quite honestly. Um, but Sears is closing more stores. 
which is unfortunate. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I got to this story. Uh, if you guys have never heard of a Juul, J-U-U-L, that's probably because you're not around a lot of teenagers. They have been in, in a lot of trouble lately because uh, they're accused of um, marketing their product to, G to teens. And if you don't know what a Juul is, a Juul is a uh, like an electronic smoking uh, thing. Thing. <laughs> they um they uh use they use jewels to teenagers mostly adults do too but uh it's like an e-cigarette and you can use it to smoke marijuana you can use it to smoke um d these different flavored things which is just it's crazy and as somebody who works with teens on a regular basis i can tell you they hot they it's it's building up a serious addiction problem it's the same thing, basically, as smoking. If you've never smoked before, it's actually almost worse. But Juul is finally pulling their mint flavor after they pulled a whole bunch of other flavors. Now, it just so happens that uh, this past a few days ago, I had a professional development about Juuls and about um, about how teens use them, and I didn't know that there were over 15,000 flavors of jewels that they had. They come with these pods. I learned more about um, e-cigarettes and smoking than I wanted to, but apparently they come in all these different flavors, 15,000 flavors and, you know, flavors like gummy bear. And I used to think to myself when they said, you know, they're marketing stuff to kids. I used to think that that was kind of a crock, but after this seminar that I sat through, I was like, wow, they really were marketing the kids. Now, my only other issue, we have middle schoolers that are smoking jewels and things like that. My only other issue is from a parenting perspective, but they talked about all the different ways that kids um, hide their, are hiding their jewels from their parents, like ordering it or a lot, they're buying. Here's, here's the, the, how they're slick. And I, I want to get this message out to parents and check on your kids. What they're doing is they're buying debit cards from like Wawa or wherever, right? Then they are putting money on them. And I guess if they have like a little job or whatever, they can put money on them. They're buying those debit cards and then they are um, and then they are having them ordering them online and having them delivered to um, to like their back door. Like they'll put the special um, put the special delivery instructions and have them delivered to the back door. And of course, kids get home before their parents do, and they'll just get to them before their parents do. And that's how they're sneaking, smoking this stuff. It's really uh, quite amazing. Like I, I never thought of, and I guess, you know, kids are sneaky in general, teenagers are. Um, so I guess I shouldn't be all that surprised, but they were telling the story about how these kids smoke these things. And I, I think from a business perspective, I think Jewel is in a lot of trouble. Um, the other thing that's in the news today, I wanted to squeeze this in before uh, <laughs> before the break, is that older workers are delaying retirement. And apparently millennials are upset about it because they're like, move out the way, old people. We can't get promoted because uh, because you guys aren't retiring. Uh, but that's according to a new uh, survey that they're upset about that. So I found that interesting. But I think that, you know, baby boomers are finding it uh, more and more difficult to retire. And that's, I'm sure that that's the problem. So you're listening to Money Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette, broadcasting live from Cape May County via SHR Media. We'll be back in a few minutes. Right now, you can get the credit you deserve. Just visit MrCreditRepair.biz. Let their expert credit repair specialist remove late payments, charge-offs, collections, even old bankruptcies fast and easy. That's MrCreditRepair.biz. Why go anyplace else? Increase your credit score today. At Mr. Credit, you always get a quality service all at our everyday discounted price. Stop getting turned down for cards, credit cards, or even new homes. Visit MrCreditRepair.biz today. That's M our credit repair dot biz. Your credit repair is our number one priority. Making a living can be tough these days with so many jobs going overseas. If you love numbers and puzzles and want job security, you can become a tax specialist with an amazing six-month tax course from Tax Mama. Operate your own tax practice locally or anywhere in the world where there are American taxpayers. 
It's a great way to write off your trips to visit family for months at a time. Everything you need to pass the IRS three special enrollment examinations is included in this course. Visit irsexams.school. And if you need more than six months, that's okay. Take your time. You're in the course until you pass the exam or until you unsubscribe and reject Tax Mama's email. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business leader, Melanie Collette, coming to you via SHR Media and broadcasting live from beautiful Cape May, New Jersey. For those of you who don't know where Cape May, uh, New Jersey is, it is right in the peninsula of New Jersey. Like people say South Jersey is like Trenton. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it, is, it is actually Cape May, which is very close to Delaware. That is the, the real South Jersey as I like to refer to it. But anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce my guest who is Peter Pitts today. And uh, a little bit about him. He's the president and co-founder of the Center for Medicine in the public interest and a visiting professor at the University of Paris's um, Descartes School, medical school, I'm sure I said that wrong. Um, from 2002 to 2004, Peter was FDA's associate commissioner for external relations, serving as senior communications and policy advisor to the commissioner. He also supervised the FDA's Office of Public Affairs, Office of the Ombudsman, Office of Special Health Issues, Office of Executive Secretariat, and Advisory Committee Oversight and Management. He served on the agency's Obesity Working Group and Counterfeit Drug Task Force as well. In addition, he served as an adjunct professor at Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs and Butler University. So without further ado, Mr. Peter Pitts. Thanks for the kind introduction to my mother in law smiling somewhere. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Um, is there anything that I left out of your bio that you wanted to share with the with the audience? Oh, it's not really about me. It's about the topic, so I'll just say uh, thanks and let's press on. Absolutely. I'd love to press on. I think one of the first things that uh, I, I know I want to talk about because it's been in the news so much and, and because we're watching the can especially the Democrat candidates talk about um, Medicare for all. I'd love to talk about whether or not something like Medicare for all would actually work, which is really socialized medicine in, in my opinion. And what your opinion is on that? You know, Medicare for all means different, different people. I'm all for it a public option that people want to find Medicare or Medicare at a certain age, I think that's fine. The uh, problem is that the government can tell a policy, you know, nationally recognized economy of scale, uh, while private insurance companies go and sell state by state. So, you know, the policy that I have for my family in New York, uh, the same exact policy in uh, Idaho or California or Kansas or Oklahoma or Atlanta or Georgia might be more expensive or less expensive. So I think that to be the level of the playing field, uh, if the government wants to sell a policy across the country, uh, so too should private insurance companies be allowed to do that. And I think the real, you know, the talking point here is that people deserve to have the same options as uh, are uh, available uh, to keep their own choices. I believe people have the have, have the best opportunity to make the right choices to choose for themselves, rather than having Uncle Sam kind of become Uncle Sam and D. It seems to me that they could possibly accomplish the same goal, but not, but not, not really, because the government really has different goals. But it seems to me that they could, they could accomplish the same thing if they did away, if, if they allowed us to uh, sell across state lines. Sure, and that's certainly one of the ways to get to get there. Because what you want to do is have people uh, have options. And for example, you know, uh, one of the big issues in healthcare is to have healthy young people in the insurance pool. And obviously, you know, under the Affordable Care Act, we tried to uh, have a penalty if they didn't, and that didn't work out because the penalty was less expensive than buying insurance when you needed it. Uh, people figured it out pretty fast. But you, you want to allow, for example, young people to buy stripped down policies, like, for example, when you offer catastrophic care. That's a good way to you know, get them into the market in the first place, once they're in the marketplace, because it's value. 
Uh, I think that when you're relying on the free market and people's intelligence, it generally work a lot better than trying to have the government design programs for people and then kind of coerce them in the way uh, into those programs. Exactly. And, that, and, and, and to me, that, uh, especially as, a, you know, for a full disclosure, um, I'm an insurance broker. I, I do life insurance. So, and one of the things that I like about being a broker is kind of the same principle. One of the things that I like is that I don't have to sell for one particular insurance company. I can sell for any insurance company that I want and I can have the insurance fit the client rather than having the um, having to squeeze the client into one particular company. If I was, you know, an, sorry, you know go ahead, I'm sorry. You know, when I was in government, I helped to design the Medicare Part D drug benefits for their seniors. And uh, people, a lot of people in Washington said, well, that'll never work. Seniors couldn't possibly make the proper choice for themselves. Uh, and they turned out to be exactly wrong. You get that data from people, and uh, the market economics work when you allow the government, rather than working against the private sector, work with the private sector. That's exactly what Medicare Part D is. It's a partnership between government and private insurance companies. And it's a perfect system why not. But seniors you generally give it a 95% plus rating, and the cost of funding way below what we expected to originally. So, again, when you allow, you look for allies rather than adversaries, things generally work out better. I agree with you. And I think that, you know, especially working with um, the older folks, a lot of them just need to be informed and just need things explained to them. I'm sorry, and the government did a very nice job stepping up to relative to uh, educating seniors on. The party drug method as with private companies because you know it's true. The educated consumer really is everybody's best customer. And as when you take the time to want people through their options and their needs, they generally make the right choice. And at the end of the day, if they make the wrong choice or their condition has changed, they can change it during the normal period. Right. But again, it has to be that's something that has to be, you know, that's something that has to be explained to people. Um, but exactly right, exactly right. You know, the only thing that has to be explained to people is that you know, there's no such thing as uh, free health care. You, you pay for it, but they don't ever. I think, just speaking for myself, I'd rather be able to pay for health care programs that I choose myself. I would pay for it through taxes and have uh, somebody in DC make my choices for me. That generally is not the best solution for anybody. No, it really isn't. It really isn't. I completely agree with that. That is, that. I mean, I, I don't understand. And I would love to have somebody, if there's anybody on the Facey chat that agrees with Medicare for all and would like to chime in on how in the world you think that that would work out. Um, I think that the, there's two plans that are out. I think Bernie Sanders' plan is out. And I believe Elizabeth Warren's plan, plan is out. And I think Elizabeth Warren's plan costs like $53 trillion or something. So some ridiculous, outrageous number that you couldn't possibly uh, have, you know, all the richest people in the world pay for. Even if all the richest people in the world pay, in the United States paid up all their money, you still would not be able to support that program. That's right. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with saying uh, saying a launch program, but I get where a lot of phones are you being very honest about exactly what she's going to do. You know, one thing that she's not really transparent about is that when you have a single payer government run health care program, what goes along with the taxes that you have to pay and the lack of the ability to buy private insurance is rational because the government makes choices and sometimes those choices don't give you what you want and now you won't even have the opportunity to get that by reaching into your own pocket. And I think that once people begin to understand that it's a one-size-fits-all proposition that doesn't really fit anybody all that well, we're going to uh, frown on it. And it's, it's almost in many respects, as a lot of newspapers have been talking about, uh, close to political Harry Carey, uh, from Senator Warren to really push the second proposition. It, it is. You wonder, and apparently her, her numbers, uh, frankly, have been slipping ever since she kind of revealed a little bit of, you know, what the cost is going to be. But we haven't we haven't begun to talk about the rationing that takes place. Other countries that have this that are, by the way, have many much smaller populations than the United States has um, are, are doing rationing. That's right. Now, also, many countries that have the single payer system. Uh, like, for example, uh, in England, the fastest growing sector of the English healthcare system is private insurance. So, you know, clearly other countries are thinking about more of a hybrid system that the government pay 
and private faith. We should actually look at what's happening right now in reality, which is kind of a fantasy land is what we want it to be. I mean, they they are having, from what I've been reading, they're having things like, um, you know, people who have, you know, some of the most basic kind of illnesses and things, at least things that are considered basic over here. They are giving people the option to uh, to to kill themselves instead of, um, you know, being able to 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 take care of them. They're giving them the option. Of, go ahead. Well, you know, we have to be honest. You know, one of the other uh, discussion points, you know, certainly during uh, the democratic debates, is the price of pharmaceuticals. Because people say to me all the time, you know, why are drugs so much less expensive in Europe and Canada than they are in the U.S.? And the truth is, not always as clear. Ninety percent of the drugs used in the U.S. by volume are generic drugs, and generic drugs are less expensive in the U.S. than Europe and Canada. And the other two is they give you this thousand-dollar drug that can't possibly believe it. Then when you ask people you know, what percent of the American healthcare spend is spent on pharmaceuticals, they generally go 40, 50, 60, 80 percent of the truth is 11.7 percent. So, you know, the issues that the candidates are railing on, you know, aren't generally presented in a truthful manner. And my new book is called Common Sense Healthcare Policy for Common Sense Americans. Because if you actually look at the facts, you recognize a lot of things, but one thing you recognize pretty quickly. That there really are no the answers to these questions. It's complicated. Um, solutions take a long time. It requires allies rather than adversaries. That helps you really in the ecosystem. But you have to understand all the all the individual parts and how they fit together. You know, it, you can't solve the healthcare debate uh, during a three minute soundbite. It's just it does not work that way. Now that's something that's very uh, plain and truthful that people don't want to talk about. You can't you can't even solve or or even explain the complexities of anybody's healthcare program uh, over a debate over an hour. You can't. That's right. What you really need to understand too is you don't want to in any way disempower patients and physicians and caregivers. And, you know, I mean, I'm a former federal official. I believe the federal government does lots of fabulous things. Not to manage people's lives, it's certainly not one of them. Oh, uh, now that's that's an interesting point that I, I that you don't hear about at all. Well, you know, when you ask people, I mean, the overwhelming majority of Americans have health care uh, either through their jobs or they buy personally. And when you say we're going to take that away from you and replace it with something that the government's going to provide, you know, whether or not you love Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, that's things most people are going to look at and really raise their eyebrows. People don't like things taken away. You don't want the government telling them how to run their laws. And again, I think if you want to have a public option for people to buy into, you have that. I think it requires a state a rejiggering of how you know, insurance is played in the country from state to federal. But that's, that's a small fix, and I think it's, it's worth testing out. When you're almost having huge, like completely eliminating private insurance and letting Uncle Sam build up a brand new, huge federal bureaucracy largely for taxes, I don't think people are going to buy it. And I, I think the, as you mentioned earlier, the, the hit that Senator Warren is taking the polls reflects that. No, I think I think it certainly does. Now, one of the things that you talk about is the need to strengthen patents and intellectual property protection. So that we can protect sustainable innovation in healthcare technologies, such as new medicines for killer diseases. I'd love for you to talk about that because that's that's certainly something that we've been talking about as far as the tariffs and, and our intellectual property being stolen. But quite frankly, I never thought about that as far as the healthcare technologies are concerned. Sure, you know, over the last fifty years, the average lifespan of the American male has increased by ten years. That's a really amazing number. And, you know, that's largely due to our ability to really, you know, ag- aggressively counter cardiovascular disease and other chronic diseases through uh, new pharmaceuticals, through innovation pharmaceuticals. And unless you protect patents and intellectual property rights, um, companies and investors don't want to uh, invest in these very high-risk propositions. So I'm saying, well, you know, don't get the government really think the drug at NIH and the drug companies are blocked. And that's just not true. Uh, government plays a very important and to get academic research. That shouldn't be you know, underestimated. But you know, they don't, they shouldn't be under the majority of the work here. And if you all look at other countries that don't aggressively provide new innovative drugs to populations, and certainly in certain types of cancer, breast cancer, you know, is a good example as well. You know, they don't have survival rates that are nearly as good as ours. 
So you want people to have the opportunity to have the drugs that the doctors want to give them. And you know, that represents a, uh, a problem as well as an opportunity relative to cost. But the solution isn't to you know, say we have enough drugs, we don't, we don't need any more, uh, or to try to nationalize this opposition. You know, those, those, those are simplistic answers. Um, but the saying that says that every complex problem with a simple solution, that's wrong. And I think that, that, that Taylor fit for political debates. People don't like to talk about the partnerships and long-term solutions and flight and exercise and personal responsibility. They talk about some fantasy solutions like drugs from Canada that simply is a, is a non-starter. So you know, we, we, we need to look at the whole healthcare ecosystem and how to really address it. Innovation from cynicals looks all of a sudden looks very attractive because it keeps people at a hospital. Uh, that's really what the majority of the healthcare dollars are spent right now is when people hit the hospital. So if we can keep people out here for, you know, for weeks and months, you know, super saves a tremendous amount of money. And that's, that's directly due to, you know, the American system of intellectual property laws. Uh, you know, th- there's a lot of talk about um, the R- R&D and the, co- the cost of research and development with different par- pharmaceutical companies um, and whether or not, you know, that I think that's the defense of pharmaceutical companies a lot of times is, you know, we need a lot of money for research and development. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 sometimes it's that the conflict is is whether or not they're really just profit taking or whether they're using it for research and development. Um, and I'm, I'm never I'm always conflicted with that. I'm like they do need a fair amount of money for research and development. But what I hear you saying is that they are doing that and that the proof is in the survival rates that we have here in the United States. Well, you know, the success rate of drugs that uh, reach the FDA are only two and ten. And the overwhelming amount of drugs that are researched don't even make it to that stage. So it's a high risk proposition. You know, so you, and, you, and you have to refactor in the cost of research and development. And I'm not saying that failed uh, research is unimportant. It's extremely important. We learn lots of things from it. But you have to amortize that into the overall price of the products. And you know, the other issue is people say my drugs are too expensive. What they generally mean is my copay and the pharmacy is too expensive. And that's not only a factor of the pharmaceutical developer, it's a factor of insurance companies and for sure from benefit managers who are, in many respects, to your point, the gouging the system. That's got to be addressed. It's got to be addressed aggressively. It does need to be addressed. How do you suggest that be addressed aggressively? Do you have any suggestions? Like if you were an advisor for, I don't know, one of President Trump's advisory boards, do you have any suggestions on how to work on that? Well, you know, there are lots of ways to get out. I think the first way is to be transparent and let the American public know exactly where all the money is going. Because when you, when you see that, you see how a lot of these public companies are backing themselves at the, at the public's expense without really bringing any added value to patient therapeutic outcomes. You begin to wonder, you know, why is that so? And, you know, if they don't want to do the right thing themselves, you know, it's, it's the role of government to step in and try to make them do a little play with the care with the public health. Exactly. That's true. That's a good way. And I think I feel like P- President Trump is kind of working uh, in, in that direction and that the pharmaceutical lobbies are not very happy with him because of it. Well, you know, anybody that's going to poke around and try to make the place fair and make a fair profit versus a huge profit knows who's going to be smiled upon. But at the end of the day, you know, people need to have broader access to high quality care. And that begins with you know having a fair price at the front of the thing. And that's as much an issue for the pharmaceutical companies as it is for the insurance companies and other kind of intermediaries who uh, skim money off the top and don't make patients any better you know, of their own volition. Now, you you talk uh, a bit about the different federal agencies, uh, such as the CDC and the FDA, and having them work a little bit better and be a little more balanced. What do you mean by that? Yeah. You know, the most important thing is the, the, the win here is to bring the medical technologies to market faster and more safely. And, and that, is a lot, that is now more possible than everything before because of new types of science and artificial intelligence. And it's not just about gathering information. Some should have to use that information and making sure doctors and nurses and pharmacists understand exactly what's going on so they can also offer patients better understanding of the medical program that they're using. But also, from, from a personal responsibility perspective, patients have to do their diet and exercise. That's true, but it's true. You need to take the medicine.
some guys push the rock, most, most people don't. And you know, we all be pulling together in the same direction. No, there's, no, there's no one party to blame. Not, not, not any single party can fix the problem. We've got to do it together. True. Um, do, you, do you have any insights as far as, because you've worked for many of these government uh, agencies and, and there's all there, there are a fair amount of conspiracy theories, if you will, out there about, for example, the FDA and whether or not they block um, holistic medicines and, 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 and natural alternatives, whether or not they give those kinds of solutions a fair shot. Do you have any kind of, I'm asking just because you've worked with them. So you know, continue to source that place. I don't look good in hats. And I really don't look good in, in aluminum hats. And I don't believe in black helicopters. And having worked inside the FDA, I can tell you the people that work there, the rest of the people that work there are dedicated to the health, to the public health. They can lose their jobs, people their salaries. They're there because they, they believe in the mission. I believe in the mission. And anybody that thinks that there's some conspiracy into the government to block certain types of medicines, I think needs to, uh, you know, get a life. <laughs> well, that, well, that response was very clear. I'm so, I am so glad that I asked you because I, I, I've read this, I've read this about, especially since, I, I mean, I, I like to use some natural uh, things. I use a blend. I don't, I think that, um, I don't think that our, you know, that the FDA is the devil or that the government is necessarily the devil close to it, but not, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um but um, I think that, you know, a, a, combi a combination of an approach is good. But you hear some holistic uh, people. I, I work with one of my holistic doctors that, that basically thinks the FDA is the devil and that, you know, there's a cure for everything and, and, and they're just hiding it and all kinds of, you know, kinds of crazy things. Well, people, people are entitled to their opinions, but not entitled to their own facts, as they say. Yeah, and uh, I believe that if you don't really understand what we're talking about, just keep your mouth shut. No, I no, I think you're absolutely right. I think that uh, you know one of the advantages or disadvantages, if you will, about having access to so so much information via the internet and, and the media is that there's a lot of uh, false information out there. That's exactly right. Now, the internet is not necessarily anybody's best source of information. You know, my advice is if you have solid questions. Talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist. Pharmacists are tremendous sources of quality information, all of a whole variety of issues. People should take more advantage of that. I think so too. And in fact, I would argue that the the pharmacists many times know more than your doctor does about the drugs that you're taking and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, doctors really are not pharmacologists, and pharmacists are. So, relative to you know, drug to drug interactions or you know, whether you're getting the proper dose or whether the drug you're taking might be expired or counterfeit or substandard. These are solid questions and stuff with pharmacists. Absolutely. I, I had a um, little uh, tiff with one of my one of my doctors one time about something that he had prescribed for me. And I asked the pharmacist and the pharmacist's answer was like completely different than my doctor's answer. And he printed something out and said, take this to your doctor like your doctor's wrong. And he was. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really important to kind of really uh, engender conversations between patients and pharmacists and physicians. That, that's a powerful team. You know, and just doing one or the other is okay, but it's not, it's not the best we can do. So people take care of all the resources that are available to them. I really stress pharmacists are being a key part of that conversation. Yep, I, I, I agree with you completely. I, I have found that to be uh, the experience. Just just logically speaking, you gotta you got to figure that they would know more. Um, that they would know more because that's that's their field. That's what they specialize in. We're up against a, a break. Let's, we're going to take a quick commercial break. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business, Stephen Melanie Clep. My guest this hour is Peter Pitts, and he is telling us he's the author of Common Sense Medicine. Uh, excuse me, Common Sense Healthcare. I apologize. Common Sense Healthcare, and he's telling us um, all all about uh, how we can get to Common Sense Healthcare and suggesting some reforms that need to be done. I'm very glad to have him on the show today. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hey, this is Michael Wright. And I'm Shannon Wright. That's full of the with Shannon Wright. From 7 to 9 a.m. Yep, right so here. everybody <laughs> else. Why are they joining us? For fun things like sports, politics. Oh, maybe some news and entertainment? And all kinds of other things. Money and recipes and events. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, so join us Monday through Thursday 
7 to 9 a.m. here on shrmedia.com. From a public locker inside a dilapidated Long Island rail station comes the show designed to piss off liberals using truth, facts, and ridicule. The Lid Radio Show, featuring the conservative voice from the People's Republic of New York, the Lid himself, Jeff Dennis. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on the SHR Media Network. Go to shrmedia.com and Lid Radio. We fight for the truth, justice, and a good poster T-bone. If you don't listen, Hillary Clinton might sneak into your bedroom in her house coat late at night and blame you for her election loss. It's the Lid Radio Show with Jeff Dunnitz. Hey girls, Carrie Girl Gear is here. Find more women every day are concealed carrying, participating in competitive shooting, and firearms training. It's not a boys' club anymore, and we don't have to shop in their stores anymore either. Finally, a cool and unique clothing line just for women. Dope tees and hats for the patriotic conceal carry and 2A girl. So, what are you waiting for? Go check out carrygirlgear.com today. It's your business diva here, Melanie Collette. I am inviting you to a front row seat as I discuss some of the most intriguing details of wealth and finance with today's movers and shakers in the world of business. Listen in and discover financial truths on a global, domestic, and household scale. Uncover topics that will impact your wallet today and in the future. Money Talk with Melanie airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. East, 2 p.m. West, right here on SHR Media at High Plains Pundit Talk Radio. You can't afford to miss it. New show on the SHR Media Network, Sackheads Against Tyranny. On shrmedia.com, go there quick like a bunny, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, every Wednesday, live and direct on the SHR Media Network, shrmedia.com, be there. Welcome back. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. My guest today is Peter Pitts. He's talking to us about common sense healthcare. Very glad to have him on the show today to talk about these topics. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up um, is about, about the drugs and about um, the discounts that never reach the patients. You hear about these huge discounts, and I think you, you touched on it earlier about how the drugs are so much cheaper cheaper in places like Canada and maybe Mexico and uh, places like that. Is, is there a reason for that? That's a really good question. You know, different countries reimburse products in different ways. I think maybe a good place to start is to pick up a newspaper and read about a new drug that so to a certain type of cancer, for example, and you see that the drug costs pick up a million dollars a year, uh, that, that's the list price. Uh, and a million dollars is a lot of money, but then you have to recognize that no one really pays that price. Because if you have five insurance, the insurance companies and the prescription benefit managers negotiate with the manufacturers a 30, 40, sometimes a 50% discount. Uh, and yet, those savings aren't always represented in lower co-pays for the patient. Uh, which is terrible because it means that the money that the discounts are, the discounts given, rather than lowering a copay to pharmacy, for example, are going into the pockets of these middlemen. And it's a great business model because they don't have other than facilitate uh, access. And, and so what, what a lot of people are saying is, well, let's give everybody the chance of a fair profit to make sure that a, a fixed amount of the rebate, 50% or sometimes more, goes towards lower and co-pays, which is what for most people drug prices mean. Okay. That that now that makes a lot of sense. I, I know I've I've run into uh situations where I, I had a client who, as a matter of fact, who was on a cancer drug and I think she said it cost thirteen hundred dollars a month. But then her doctor was able to get her the discount through some kind of program. But 
if, if she did not have that kind of doctor who was able to help her that way, she would have been kind of left in the lurch. And that's that's the right. another, go- that's right. another thing is that you know, the, the copay is oftentimes based is oftentimes based on the list price of the drug rather than the price that the insurance company has negotiated. So they're trying to you know, have it both ways, both getting a bigger discount for the pocket, but then keeping the keeping the pocket high based on the list price. That's to me just dishonest and probably close to feeling. Now, is there? A, I suppose that 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 there's something that legislators should be able to do about that. Well, there there are a couple of things, and this is illegal because of what's called the safe harbor rule. So you have to ask yourself: you know, when does a rebate become a fraud or a kickback? And the answer is what the government says it is. So the Trump administration had played around with I think what I think is a pretty sound policy of doing away with that safe harbor. Forcing companies to play fairly as opposed to hiding behind uh, this new rule, but they, they backed off, unfortunately. The other thing that they did do is, I mean, you probably, you're not going to believe this. Uh, when you walk into the pharmacy, sometimes because of the weird way our healthcare pricing system is structured, it's cheaper to pay cash than to use your insurance. Yes. Uh, but for, for years, there's something called the gag rule that made it illegal, not impractical, but illegal for pharmacists to tell you that. And what the government has done in the past few months is to say, no, if it's cheaper for you to buy the product through cash, the pharmacists should be allowed to tell you that. So these gag rules are slowly falling by the wayside as, as they should. Uh, so all of a sudden, and again, it's, it's empowering the pharmacists to help their patients, their customers, uh, have access to products through you know, the, the cheapest means available. Wow. That's horrible. That's just horrific. And I know you have to go in a, in a couple of minutes. So before we go, I want to uh, make sure you're able to tell the audience where they can pick up your book. Oh, thanks so much for asking. So again, it's called Common Sense Healthcare for Common Sense Americans. It's available on Amazon, obviously, or at our website, which is cfpi.org. And you know, I urge you to have a look at it. Because what I say in this book is, if you're talking to a political candidate and they can't explain to you how their plans for healthcare protects innovation, uh, you should really ask a lot of questions. And then give them a copy of my book, and, and I'll pay for it. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. Thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Good conversation, and congratulations on your recent electoral victories. Thank you. Thank you. It was, a, it was a great time. Lots of hard work. I appreciate it. I hope you'll come back. Thanks very much. All right. Later. Thanks. You're listening to Money Talk with Melanie. I'm your business diva, Melanie Collette. That was Peter Pitts, ladies and gentlemen, who was talking to us today about common sense healthcare. I hope he, unfortunately, he was traveling. So the sound was not as great as I would have liked it to be, but hopefully you got the gist of what he was trying to communicate to all of us. Some very good information there. And hey, buy his, buy his book, Common Sense Healthcare. It's available on Amazon, as, as he said. Uh, you should check that out. And I want to thank you guys so much for being here. Thank everybody in the Facey chat. And if you're listening to this via a download, thank you very much for listening via download on iTunes and any other modes of podcasts that you can listen to. And we'll be back next week with another uh, wonderful guest. Just the, an FYI, a couple of weeks ago, I was at um, the National Publicity Summit. And one of the things that I'm able to do there is is have access to all of these um, wonderful uh, guests and people that want to be on the show. And so I have a whole bunch of really cool guests coming up. So I hope that you're going to join me uh, Fridays at five o'clock for Money Talk with Melanie. Remember, this is very important because after all, It's your money. Have a great weekend.